Good morning, everyone. We're letting our friends in from the waiting room and we will begin our presentation in just about 30 seconds. All right, good morning. Welcome everyone. We're so glad that you joined us today. Welcome to the American Cancer Society Virtual Breast Cancer Leadership <laughs> Forum for the states of West Virginia and Ohio. My name is Deb Dillingham and I'm the Senior Director for Cancer Control Strategic Partnerships here in Ohio and West Virginia. It's my pleasure to welcome you today. We're so glad that you chose to join us. We're going to do a poll question just to start our morning off. So you should see that popping up on your screen here in just a second. We just want to know where you're joining us from today. If you would just select the state that you are in, we would just love to know where our audience is joining us from today. We'll have a couple of polls throughout this presentation and we would just love to have your participation in those. We ask that if you've called in from a phone that you please enter your name and organization in the Q&A so we have a record of your attendance. I wanted you to know that all lines will be muted during the program and we ask that all questions be entered into the Q&A tab on your screen. Each presenter will be answering questions after their presentation. And if we don't have time to get to your question during the Q&A session with the presenter, we will work with them to answer your question after the event. You can see on the screen a few things we want you to know. The Consortium for Health Education in Appalachia, Ohio is approved as a provider of nursing continuing professional development by the Ohio Nurses Association and accredited approver by the American Nurses Credentialing Center Commission on Accreditation. This course will provide two contact hour for nurses. You'll receive a certificate for claiming your CEs after today's event. Our objectives for today's event are on the current slide. We hope you'll take note of those. Please note also that the planning committee members and speakers have declared that there are no relative financial arrangements or affiliations with the organization that may affect balance, independency, objectivity, or scientific rigor for the CE event. Also, please know the slides will be available after the presentation and this event is being recorded. There's no way to know how to prevent breast cancer but there are things you can do that might lower your risk, such as changing the risk factors that are under your control. I now have the pleasure of introducing Barb Diamond. Barb's been a volunteer with ACS Cancer Action Network for all 20 of their years and for 38 years with the American Cancer Society. She's also been a Voice of Hope speaker for the last three years. Barb's story started in 1968 when her mother was diagnosed with breast cancer. Her only treatment options were radical mastectomy and full body radiation, which weren't enough. She lost her fight two years later. Years passed, research developed, new treatments and mammography guidelines. One of the biggest reasons Barb became involved with the ACS was to help raise money for research. I now turn the program over to you, Barb. Thank you very much, Deb. <clears throat> uh, welcome and thank you all for joining us. We're joined today by leaders across the state who, like you, have a deep passion for preventing cancer. We know that mammography screenings were greatly hindered by the COVID-19 pandemic. It will take every single person listening today doing all they can in their sphere of influence to get those who need mammography screening and get those who fell due, behind the pan due to the pandemic screened as well. Today, we will provide you with a picture of the impact of COVID-19 on mammography screenings and provide you with tools and resources that you can use to react, reactive your, reactivate your mammography screening efforts. As Deb said, my story started a long time ago, in 1968 when my mom was diagnosed. <clears throat> At that point in time, and by the way, it's the last picture I have of my, my mom, my dad and I together, um, when she was diagnosed, there was no re regular annual mammography. There were no guidelines. So she was first 
died, first saw the doctor after she had lived with a lump in her breast for two years, because at that point in time, breast cancer was pretty much considered a death sentence. So when she finally went to the doctor, she found out her only treatment options were a radical mastectomy, which <clears throat> involved taking all the lymph nodes also, and full body radiation, which weren't enough. She lost her fight two years later. Years passed and research developed new treatments and the mammography guidelines. And it's because of those guidelines that I'm here today. My doctor recommended that I get my baseline mammogram before I turned 35, which kind of took me a little bit longer to do because he recommended it when I was 33 and I didn't do it. And he recommended when I was 34 and I didn't do it at first, but then my husband found the order for the mammography and said, would you please do this for me? So that's when I went to get my first baseline mammogram. And that's when my overly aggressive cancer was found. And that saved my life. If it had been found six months later, I would have been terminally ill. It was only seven millimeters when it was found, so I couldn't feel it. But if I had waited until I could feel it on a self-exam, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you today. One of the interesting aspects of my diagnosis was that in 1991, I was the exception to the rule. I was not expected to have cancer. Okay? I was too young. And the type of cancer I had, which was a triple negative ductal cancer in C2, was exceedingly rare at that time in my age group and virtually unheard of. Because I was outside the normal age range for breast cancer, I had a lot of doctors that wanted to see me and meet with me. And I was invited to be part of a case study at the University of Michigan, which is where we were living at the time. I chose not to participate because I needed peace of mind when I got up every morning and I looked in the mirror and not worrying whether my cancer was coming back or not. So I chose a modified radical mastectomy with partial lymph node dissection. Fortunately, the lymph nodes came back clear and I was declared cancer free after surgery. That's what got me involved with the American Cancer Society. I had never met a woman who had survived breast cancer until I met my Reach to Recovery volunteer. So I started as soon as I was cleared. And during my volunteer work with the American Cancer Society and ACS Can, I've met many people who have been diagnosed outside of the norm, from young women with breast cancer or cervical cancer to my father, who was diagnosed with a soft tissue sarcoma in his breastbone at age of 82. He was way outside the normal. That normal is in men between the ages of 25 and 50, and it's usually on an extremity such as a leg or an arm. But because of his age and the location of his tumor, he only had one or two treatment options, not nearly as many as a friend of mine who's diagnosed with the same disease, but fell into the normal range. One of the biggest reasons I became involved with ACS was to help raise money for research. At first, it was for breast cancer because that was what was closest to my heart. But by 2001, my dad had been diagnosed along with several friends who were also outside the normal for their cancers. All of them had limited treatment options and lost their fight. My motives for increasing research funding had gone from one specific cancer to all types of cancer. I was tired of hearing about people who were diagnosed out of the normal range or other normal expectations for that particular type of cancer. The only way to fight that is through more research funding. 20 years ago in Pennsylvania, my ACS staff partner asked me to become a member of a new organization. And that is how I came to join the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network. And I've stayed with it through different states and and back in it while I'm here in Ohio. Every year we fight for additional funding for the National Institute of Health, the National Cancer Institute and the CDC to advance the fight against cancer. Okay, all right, before we begin our program, we wanted to recognize and thank our sponsors. Well, let's go through the agenda first. Oh, <laughs> all right, so you've, you've seen it and myself, Next, we have coming up Dr. Amy Krieger from the Ohio State University Medical Center, who will give a presentation, followed by a short session for question and answers. And then she'll be followed by Chesley Chatham from University Hospitals and their capacity 
and her subject is hospital systems capacity building components of a practice project. That will be updated by one of my staff partners, Leo Almeida from ACS CAN, and then we'll be followed by Carla Wysoski to go over tools and resources to resume breast cancer screening. And the, finally, we'll have the next steps in evaluation by Deb. So we'd like to recognize our sponsors for today. And without the generous support of the Ohio State University, Summa Health, and Ohio University College of Osteopathic Medicine, this program would not be possible. Also, thank you to the Ohio Partners for Cancer Control Comprehensive Cancer Coalition for their support and dedication to this program in the fight against cancer in Ohio. We would also like to extend a special thank you to PJ Corn Conrath, Area Health and Education Center and Nurse Planner for her support in providing CMEs for this program. Now I'll turn it back over to Deb. Thank you, Barb. Thank you so much for sharing your story and for sharing how this disease has impacted your life in such tremendous ways. So thank you. We appreciate you being with us today. My pleasure. Our first speaker today is Dr. Amy Kerger. Uh, Dr. Kerger is a radiologist who specializes, specializes in breast imaging at the Stephanie Spielman Comprehensive Breast Center, which is one of 51 NCI designated centers in the United States. The mission of the Spielman Center resonates with her as a physician. She believes strongly in empathetic care and always treating her patients as if they were family. She also enjoys improving processes for patient care, giving lectures, and doing interviews to help educate colleagues and the public about breast health and imaging and working with specialized team of caregivers to ensure the best care for her patients. Dr. Kerger is speaking on the importance of screening, the gaps created by COVID, COVID issues with screening, and any disparities in these areas. Welcome, Dr. Krieger. We turn it over to you. Thank you, Deb. It's so nice to be here with you all today and to talk about things that are near and dear to my heart and really important topics right now in this world as we're moving forward uh, through this COVID pandemic. Um, next slide, please. Um, today, like Deb said, we're going to talk about what is breast cancer screening? Why is that important? Um, why do we recommend annual breast screening starts at the age of 40? There is some confusion surrounding those guidelines and why we recommend that compared to other groups. Um, how COVID has impacted breast cancer screening. Um, the talk of uh, the COVID vaccine causing enlarged lymph nodes in the axilla or lymphadenopathy and what to do about that and how we're dealing with that and about breast cancer screening disparities. We have had those prior to the COVID pandemic, but the COVID pandemic has not helped us um, with those in any way, shape or form. So we want to talk about what those are and how we can move forward with those. Um, first, we're going to just start talking about breast cancer screening, what it is, why it's important. <clears throat> as we, as you heard from Barb, earlier with that beautiful story about her, her own um, time through breast cancer and her mom's experience through her breast cancer. Um, you know, we have started a breast cancer screening program back in the 1980s. Um, and before that, women did not get annual screening mammograms. And after that, it did become more widespread, but not until the early 90s um, did we really ramp up breast cancer screening in this country. And we still have a large number of women, probably about 20% of the population that does not get annual screening uh, to this day. So we're doing great, but we could we have room for improvement. Um, since the 1980s, we have seen a plummet in breast cancer deaths by 30 to 40% in those who are screened, which is huge and that's amazing. And if we got that extra 20% screen, we'd probably see that number rise even further. Um, you know, one in eight women in their lifetime will get breast cancer. That's a large number of women. And so that's why screening is so important because we want to catch it early um, when it's treatable, when the treatment is not as extensive. Um, you know, breast cancer currently today accounts for about 30% of all new invasive cancers that are diagnosed in any part of the body. Um, so 30% of that is breast cancer, mostly in women, but men also get breast cancer too. It's about 1% of men who do get breast cancer. Um, you know, it's still the leading common cause of non-skin cancer um, in the U.S. in women. And it's the second leading cause of cancer deaths 
and premature deaths in women still. And we'd like to see that number go down or away at some point. The goal of breast cancer screening, like I said, is to reduce death. We want to not have people dying of this disease. We want to have people getting through this and living great lives and moving forward. Um, and that's why I went into this field is because I want to be a part of making that happen. We also, part of that is not wanting to get very extensive treatments. Our treatments are great and they're getting further along and we're doing better with them. But the, the long, later stage the breast cancer is found, the more extensive the treatment is. The earlier your breast cancer is found, the less extensive your treatment is and the better chance for survival and more, you know, good experience with life further in the future. So we wanna catch this early and that's why we recommend screening. Um, why do we recommend screening at 40? Well, the American College of Radiology, the American College of Surgeons, the Society of Breast Imaging and the American Society of Breast Diseases all recommend starting breast cancer screening at the age of 40 and doing it annually. Now I know there's a lot of differing guidelines out there. Some say 45, some say 50 and every other year. Um, the United States Task Force came out with that many years ago. It's been gosh, eight to nine years now, um, but that's never actually been put into law um, because women like yourselves and societies like mine have been fighting to not allow that to go into law because we really strongly believe 40 is the right age and annually is super important. We know that breast cancer size can double within a two-year period of time, which then makes that cancer more aggressive. We also know that one in 69 women in their 40s will be diagnosed with an invasive breast cancer. And of those women, 70% of women who die from breast cancer in their 40s are of the 20% of women in their 40s that are not being annually screened. So we know the screening is important. If you start screening in your 40s and do it annually, you will see a 40% reduction in dying from breast cancer. When we start it in, the, in their 50s and they're screened every other year, there's only a 23% reduction in dying from breast cancer. So that's about half. Um, and like I said before, it's also the extensive treatments that we wanna not have to put you through by catching this early. Um, the other thing is, is that, you know, there was a lot of talk around why we push the age back. The United States Task Force wants to put the age back to 50 and every other year is because the two big reasons that they discussed were anxiety about getting called back from your screening, um, which of course is very real. And if any woman who's ever been called back from a screening can attest to that or have to get a breast biopsy, it's very scary. And there's a lot of anxiety around that, which is expected and understood. And the idea of overdiagnosing, are we you know, biopsying more women or treating too aggressively. And that's something that we've been looking at very seriously. Um, there's been a lot of studies out there around the anxiety um, and most women would tell you, yes, I had anxiety after I got called back. Yes, I was super nervous and I had a lot of anxiety about my breast biopsy, but whether they were diagnosed with cancer or they weren't diagnosed with cancer, they all felt a lot better afterwards and were super glad they did it and returned to screening. Um, many women had more anxiety and regret when they didn't get annual screening and then we found a more advanced cancer that they waited. And I've heard many women tell me that who have you know, not gotten their screening annually or behind a little bit. And they're very upset with themselves when we find something. Um, Overdiagnosis really can't be measured directly. We don't always know which cancers that we diagnose are going to be super aggressive and fast growing and which ones won't because each person's body has different biology. We have similar cancers but everybody's body is going to react to those cancers differently. And so a huge part of the overdiagnosis piece that's been talked about is surrounding um, ductal carcinoma in situ, which is a very early form of breast cancer, which is something we want to find on early because we can treat that um, and it's not become invasive yet. And so that's the kind of cancer we want to find. And we know that DCIS or ductal carcinoma in situ will eventually become an invasive cancer. So that was put into the overdiagnosis piece that counted for about 10% of overdiagnosis. Of that, the DCIS was about 9% of that. So really only 1% of overdiagnosis is there. Um, and most women I've talked to, uh, including myself, would rather get a biopsy to know everything's okay than not get one and have had a more advanced cancer. So there also is a risk in not screening and treatment advances are really important, but they cannot overcome the disadvantage of being diagnosed with a breast cancer at an advanced stage. 
Um, I'm also asked a lot by my patients about risk factors, which we're going to talk about here in a second, and family history for breast cancer. I get a lot of women when I'm talking about them needing a biopsy saying, oh, well, there's no breast cancer in my family, so it's going to be completely fine, um, which does help to not have family history or a genetic mutation that puts you at a much higher risk for having breast cancer. However, you know, 80 to 85% of women diagnosed with breast cancer do not have a family history or a genetic mutation that we're aware of. Um, so, you know, that's a large part, part of the population. And a lot of women, I think, think, well, because I don't have a family history or there's no genetic mutation, I really don't need to be screened. But the larger part of the population are people who don't fall into that category. So that's why annual screening is really important. Next slide, please. So here's risk factors for breast cancer that we look at when we're trying to decide if you have an increased risk for getting breast cancer in your lifetime or a decreased risk, and kind of you're at that average risk population. Um, we really encourage all women to start discussing with their primary care physician at the age of 30, their risk factors. And this is something you can bring up to your primary care physician um, and providers who are on this call who are primary care should be bringing this up to their patients. You know, just going through these risk factors. Um, some women, you know, think the only risk factor is whether you have a BRCA mutation and that is not the only risk factor. Um, not all of these alone make you at a high risk for breast cancer, but when we start adding them up, it does increase the risk. So if you have several of these um, risk factors and you and your physician discuss them, they may want to send you to see one of the a high risk um, provider to see if you do need a genetic workup or if you're in that high risk, do you need supplemental screening? So we still always recommend annual mammogram, but for high risk patients, which we say is a greater than 20% lifetime risk of getting breast cancer, the average person who has none of these risk factors or lower risk, maybe a couple, is at 13% risk. Um, at those people that are at the higher risk, we recommend supplemental screening, usually with MRI. Um, but we wanna also do a clinical exam more frequently and have you seen. Here at Ohio State, we actually have a high risk program. And we have providers that all they do all day is look at, talk to women about high risk and talk about their breast cancer risk factors um, and refer them for genetics. And we have a whole genetics team also. Um, so if you talk with your provider and you're falling to this, you should look into seeing somebody who, you know, who specializes in high risk to get this looked at and make sure that if you need additional screening, that you get that screening. Next slide, please. So this is just um, a nice pictogram of the risks of you know, follow-up testing, risk of mammographic screening. So out of every 100 women that we screen, 90, per, 90 of those women will have a benign finding on their mammogram. So we'll tell them you're fine, come back next year. 10 women will be asked to be returned return for additional mammograms or ultrasounds, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. Of those, six of those will get some additional imaging and be told everything's fine. Um, and about two of those women will be asked to return in six months for a follow-up exam, whether it's by mammogram, ultrasound, or both. Um, if you're asked to return in six months, I want you to know that we, the breast radiologists, we have to have a less than 2% suspicion that this could be a cancer in order to do a follow-up. So that's a very, very small number. So if we're saying that, you know, we're feeling pretty confident that in six months, it'll be okay. And why six months? Six months, because we know if it's going to change, we want to catch it earlier than at a year, um, because if it is a faster growing cancer that was acting like a benign thing, we want to catch it early and biopsy it then. Um, if you come back in six months and it's stable, it hasn't grown, we'll ask you to come back in six more months. If at a year, it's still stable. We'll ask you to come back in another year. If it gets smaller, we send you back to screening because breast cancer does not cure itself. Um, and if it would get larger, we'll biopsy it. And still some of those will be benign, but we want to make sure we catch things early, like we talked about. Um, and of those 10 women, two women will get a breast biopsy, a needle biopsy, which is minimally invasive um, and will be sent off for pathology. So about, you know, one to two percent, one to two women per 100 will get a biopsy. Next slide, please. So we talk about additional imaging, and I think this is something I wanted to discuss because I think a lot of people don't know what it means when we get called back for additional imaging. Um, and they can be additional mammogram views or additional ultrasounds. Um, and I think a lot of women think, well, I just had a mammogram or I just had an ultrasound if you're getting screening ultrasounds. So I want to explain what those look like and 
and why we call you back for them, because we're looking at a specific area of concern that we're seeing, whether it's on the mammogram or the ultrasound, that we want to look at a little further and in a little more depth. Um, next slide, please. So this is an uh, this is an example of a mammogram that's come back for another look. As you can see, there's some white areas at the top and bottom. Um, and though that's a compression paddle. So we take a special paddle, um, can be square or round, depending upon um, what we're looking at. And we put a little bit more pressure on the breast in an area that we are looking at. And the area that's circled and squared was the area of concern. This is also a 3D mammogram. So you're able to see what our 3D mammograms look like. Um, and as you can see, there's kind of like a brighter white area that looks like a star. It's a little speculated as we call it. So that area was of concern and it stayed of concern. Next slide, please. So we did an ultrasound also in that area because on mammogram, all masses can look white like your breast parenchyma. So we have to do an ultrasound to see, do we think it's solid? What does the margins look like? Do we think it's a cyst um, and to know what to do with it? And this is that mass from that ultrasound. Um, as you can tell, the areas that are marked um, with the number one and two and the little um, plus signs are what we're measuring. And that looks very suspicious and it looks like a solid um, tumor. So we then recommended this for biopsy and it turned out to be an invasive ductal carcinoma. Um, next slide, please. Here's another mammogram that was done. Um, this lady had a area of palpable concern that you can see with a little triangle noted in on the breast here. Um, underneath that triangle, you can see it's kind of like a bunch of white snowballs that you can see there. Um, and so with this, we did the 3D mammogram. So we can see like a pretty good circumscribed mass. So we didn't add any extra views um, with that compression paddle, but we went on to ultrasound. So next slide, please. And I just wanted to show you a comparison where here's a mass that looks white also on the mammogram. And when we go to ultrasound, there's this oval shaped anacoke is what we call it, but it looks black like the background of the screen. This is a benign cyst and we don't need to do anything with this unless the woman is symptomatic. We can always drain them if they're very painful. Um, and But this is totally benign and the patient can go right back to screening without any problem. Next slide, please. So the other things I get asked about screening mammograms are radiation risks. Um, the amount of radiation in a mammogram is one of the things I get asked a lot, including with the 3D mammogram. And even with the 3D component to the mammogram, your risk of radiation is lower than your normal background radiation. A lot of people don't know that every day walking around, we get radiation from the sun and other sources. Um, and I always tell patients that one screening mammogram is about the same amount of radiation as if you took a flight from Columbus to San Francisco one way. So if you got on a plane and did that, you'd get the same radiation from that as you do from your screening mammogram. So, you know, we always look at keeping all radiation as low as reasonably possible. We also look at risks versus benefits. Does it benefit you more for giving you this little bit of radiation compared to the risk of the breast cancer? And so um, we've done a great job over the years of getting these radiation um, numbers down and we continue to even strive for further and lower numbers. But the risk of having an advanced breast cancer is a bigger risk to your life than the little teeny amount of radiation we're giving you with the screening mammogram. And then I also get asked about, you know, concerns about the diagnostic, if you were to get that. And our diagnostic mammograms radiation risk is pretty small too. And yes, it's a little more than you might get annually if you were to get called back, but we're making sure everything's okay. And if it were to be a cancer, it'd be well worth those risks. Um, and then I get asked a lot about radiation to the thyroid because Dr. Oz talked about this quite a few years ago on a show and it's kind of stuck around. And if you ask for a thyroid shield, we'll happily give you one, but you really don't need one because the radiation risk from a breast mammogram to your thyroid is pretty minuscule. Um, in fact, thyroid cancer incidence has gone up equally in men and women and few men get mammograms because we don't annually screen men. So that tells us that you know, the risk from the radiation of the mammogram is not affecting thyroid cancer risk. Next slide, please. So breast cancer screening and COVID. We know that there was a pause in breast cancer screening last year for about a month to six weeks due to the COVID pandemic, which had to happen because we, 
you know, had people being sick, we did not want to bring lots of people unnecessarily into hospital situations and around patients that were undergoing cancer treatment too, um, and expose everybody to something we were unsure of. And as we've moved forward, we've learned a lot more every day about the COVID virus and what to do and what not to do. Um, and with that, you know, I think we, we did absolutely the right thing by putting a pause on things, but unfortunately that same pause made all of us kind of forget to come back. Uh, you know, a lot of us forget to come back to go to back to screening. Um, I did get my mammogram, but I do work here, but I have forgotten to go back to the dentist. So, you know, I'm in the same boat as many people with not always going back and doing the things that I'm supposed to do um, to, you know, take care of my own self because it got paused and just, we get out of our normal cycle and we get busy and the pandemic has caused a lot of stress and, and stuff to many people um, and just kind of disrupted our lives. So, um, you know, but because of the pandemic, a lot of the research going forward is showing that we're looking at probably about 35,000 more breast cancers that are getting delayed in detection, um, which will increase our breast cancer related deaths because of delay in screening. Um, you know, another question I asked lots, is it safe to return to screening? And the answer is yes, even with the rise in the Delta variant, you know, we still have protocols in place because some of us are vaccinated, some of us are not vaccinated. Um, and even with that vaccine, vaccine, we know, you know, that we don't want to harm anybody while we're around people not knowing. Um, so there are safety protocols. Everybody must wear a mask when they come in. Um, our staff, you know, they have instructions on how to help and make sure you're safe while you're here and everyone around you is safe. So just follow the staff's instructions. If you have any anxiety about coming in when you call to schedule, please talk with the scheduler about what safety protocols are in place where you're going. And they're happy to answer any concerns you might have. And if they don't know the answers, they'll find somebody who does to help you feel safe about coming in. Um, we at Ohio State will text and call you prior to your appointment um, to remind you if you're not feeling well to go see your PCP and kind of go through um, the symptoms that could be COVID to make sure that you're safe to come in. Um, at that same uh, call, we'll remind you not to bring a caregiver unless it was cleared by a provider. We're still not allowing people to bring people with them unless um, they're seeing like a surgeon or one of the med -onc docs and that's already been cleared. Um, and so at times we are allowing caregivers, but not just for regular screening, just to try to keep the numbers in our waiting rooms down because they're not large spaces. Um, we are spacing chairs still out six feet apart. Um, and we're having hands cleaning of all of our machines in our rooms. Our staff is masked, they're wearing goggles and they're wearing um, gloves when they take care of you. And we also, when you're being registered, I'm gonna show you on the next slide here in a couple, um, the questionnaire we do just to ensure that, you know, nothing has been missed as far as uh, any potential COVID risk. Um, we also know that our minority race and ethnicity and you know, Medicare insurance coverage and people at advanced age have had more association with missed or canceled appointments after shutdown. And we know that these, this, these groups of people at baseline have disparities of getting in to get screened and stuff that we are working on that we'll talk about here in a few slides, but they also have a disproportionate higher number of COVID infections. So we're trying to better allocate resources strategically used to better tailor to the underserved steps in addressing longstanding inequities and increased efforts to reschedule screenings, especially in this group. We, we've been calling people, we've been sending letters, trying to find ways to you know help people with transportation to make sure that they can get to um, screening sites. Um, we have a mobile vans that go out to places too to try to help with that. Um, all patients, especially you know these subgroups, have you know you know may have a preference to distance themselves for potential COVID infections, especially a lot of our elderly patients, especially at the beginning and the rise of this. You know didn't you know were afraid to come out because they were the people that were getting the sickest at that time. So we we've done a really good job of trying to combat a lot of that. And we want to try to help people get back into their annual screening. Next slide, please. So this is an example of the um, sheet that will be filled out on the computer uh, with the registrar when you come in, just making sure that you are safe to come into the building and, you know, didn't yourself miss some symptom of COVID because they seem to have, there's a lot of symptoms that are like a lot of other things, but we have to be extra cautious in this day and age to make sure that we keep people safe. So we kind of go through this checklist just to make sure everything's good. Next slide, please. So our first COVID vaccine was given on December 14th in 2020. Um, a question I get a lot 
is, is the COVID vaccine and put me at a higher risk for breast cancer? And the answer to that is no, there is no association between the COVID vaccine and an increased risk of breast cancer. However, we do see a side effect in some people, men and women, um, of lymphadenopathy or swollen lymph nodes under your arm, um, feeling that you can feel like mass under there or swelling, or it's like a little more inflamed after the COVID vaccine. This can happen after the first or the second or both. Um, and like I said, it can happen in men or women. Um, this is not by itself unique to the COVID vaccine. This actually happens with shingles vaccines, pneumonia, um, diphtheria vaccine and tetanus. We see these in many vaccines. It's just, I think because we're giving the COVID vaccine at such a large amount um, in, in the population right now, we're, we're noticing these side effects a little more uh, rapidly in people because um, there's so many people getting the vaccine all at once that we're seeing it a little more often. So in breast imaging, this is, was noted pretty um, early on that we, people are having these reactions. So, you know, we are aware that this is going on. We are aware people are symptomatic and there's a, you know, several ways that we can help treat these things and, and deal with them um, for, for you, the patient and make you feel comfortable. Next slide, please. So, you know, a lot of patients ask, what happens if I get a swollen lymph nodes under my arm after COVID? Should I ignore it? What should I do with it? And no, don't ignore it. Please go see your doctor, um, have them do a physical. Some of your doctors might feel comfortable saying, hey, let's just follow this up in about four to six weeks after your you know, vaccine. And as long as you're not getting your second dose, then they may wait till after the second dose and then follow it up again. Um, but we know that within four to six weeks, eight weeks at the, at the latest that we're seeing these resolve. Um, they may also send you for a mammogram and an ultrasound, um, and we'll work that up and make sure everything is okay. Um, if you come in and you get your screening and you had your COVID vaccine, um, our technologists are ask all patients when they had their COVID vaccine and what the dates were, um, because we want to know that for this particular thing, because we have a lot of patients that come in for screening and we actually see more prominent lymph nodes on the mammogram. And this way we can actually, um, assess those lymph nodes, knowing that that vaccine was done. Some of us, depending upon what we see in the breast, we may call you back for additional images or an, act, or an ultrasound of the axilla. Um, sometimes you might get a little blurb on your screening mammogram saying there is some prominence in, let's say your vaccine was in the left arm, you know, in the lymph nodes in the left axilla scene. Um, However, this may be due to COVID vaccine reactivity. If in four to six weeks, these symptoms are still there or there is clinical concern, um, you know, patient can have a mammogram or an ultrasound, or we might actually ask you to come back for that mammogram or for an ultrasound of the axilla, but we may wait. We may ask you to wait four to six weeks before coming back um, so that we can look, we don't charge you for two ultrasounds. Um, if we see something prominent and then we want you to come back again, we kind of sometimes are waiting out that time to see if it all just kind of resolves itself and it looks good, then we're done. And if it doesn't, then we'll do a biopsy and make sure everything's okay. And so what happens if, you know, swollen, I'm oh, oh, sorry, I covered that. Um, and then the other question I get asked a lot is, you know, should I, should I hold off getting my mammogram till my vaccine is done? Or should I not get the vaccine until I get my mammogram? And you know, obviously if you can get your mammogram before you get your vaccine, that's great, but we don't want you not getting a mammogram or not getting your vaccine because of this side effect. We've, we're very well aware of it. We're, you know, we've seen enough of it that we feel very comfortable dealing with this and we will not let you fall through the cracks or anything um, happen. So please, you know, get your mammogram, get your vaccine and, you know, just supply us with the dates that you got your vaccine and what arm, if you can remember that when you come for your mammogram, that'll be super helpful. So that'll help us know what we're looking at if, they, if you have any of these swollen lymph nodes. Next slide, please. So here's an example. Um, you can see on the left side where it says LMLO on the uh, right side of the screen here, um, there's a little triangular marker up there and un underneath that you can see kind of a white area up there um, that's kind of prominent compared to the other side on the right um, breast, which is on the left side of your screen, um, which those are lymph nodes and those lymph nodes in, on the, um, in the left breast there on the right side of the screen look prominent. So the lady then went and had an ultrasound. Next slide, please. And this is what an abnormal appearing lymph node looks like. Um, you can see it's um, the black area here in the center is the lymph node. 
and it looks very, very, very plump. Um, it's missing what we call a fatty hilum, which you'll see when I show you a normal looking lymph node. Um, and this was biopsied and this was a breast cancer. Next slide, please. As opposed, this is a normal appearing lymph node in the same patient. Um, and as you can see, there's like a thin black line and under in, underneath that is kind of like a brighter area that's called a fatty hilum. But we want lymph nodes to look like this. We want them to be thin and not plump like that. Next slide, please. And this was the little, this was the cancer in her left breast that we found at two o'clock in the breast here, that small black area in the center of the screen. Next slide, please. This is a different patient who just came from a regular screening mammogram. And as you can see on the right side of your screen, which is her left breast compared to the left side of the screen, which is the right breast, um, the lymph nodes up there at the top of the screen, um, the kind of bright white areas, they're a little more noticeable on the left. Not that they're not, there are more of them. Yes, that doesn't matter. It's just that they're kind of plumper um, on the left side than the right. So we called her back and went and looked at them under ultrasound. And she had had her COVID vaccine in that left arm, and we knew that. Um, and these look a little plumper than that one I showed you that was normal, um, but they don't look bad like the one I showed you that was cancer. So we know this is kind of a typical look, and we call these reactive. You can get reactive lymph nodes for lots of things. I'm sure we've all had lymph nodes underneath our neck here where they get swollen when we don't feel well. Um, they can happen everywhere in your body. Um, and so for this lady, um, we actually had biopsied th these because this was early on before we knew about all the lymphadenopathy and these were reactive. Um, so it fit the, the bill. So a lot of times when we're seeing these now and we have patients who are asymptomatic and we don't see anything on the mammogram that's of concern, we're following these up uh, with either a clinical exam or an ultrasound in four to six weeks. Next slide, please. So we're going to talk a little bit about breast cancer screening, COVID, and healthcare disparities. As I mentioned earlier, you know, the pandemic has exacerbated healthcare disparities. Um, and, you know, we need to increase education, communication with a full diversity of patients to help alleviate the and reduce these burdens and these barriers to healthcare. And there's a lot of research going on out there right now around all of this, which I think is fantastic and well overdue. I also think that there's a lot of talk about guidelines for minority groups and making sure that we educate our minority groups and we get access to care that is equal for our minority groups. Um, you know, we know women of African American descent, Hispanic, Black, and Asian women that we have a delay in screening um, to age 50, they have a higher chance of adverse effects. One third of these women who are diagnosed with breast cancer before the age of 50. So that's like 30% of them are diagnosed before 50. So waiting till 50 is too late. We also know that many of these women will have more advanced and um, more aggressive breast cancers, especially in our black population. And we wanna catch those earlier and provide good and better treatments and with quicker access to care. Um, you know, we need to do earlier risk assessments. We need to have equal access to high quality mammograms starting at 40 and equitable treatment that could reduce these disparities in minority women. We're not only seeing a delay in screening, but we're also seeing a delay in the diagnostic workup and to the biopsy. So we need to do more to address those issues um, and figure out what those issues are. According to the National Cancer Institute Surveillance Epidemiology and End Results data, which was published in 2015, which is a few years ago, but they published us every so many years, you know, since the 1980s, as I mentioned before, we've had a decrease of breast cancer related deaths about 43%. Um, however, the death rate amongst black women has been only 23% decrease since that screening has compared to white women, which is 43%. And that's just unacceptable. And we need to do better to make sure that those numbers are equal. Um, you know, 47, 40% increased risk of dying from breast cancer are seen in non-Hispanic Black women due to the fact that um, non-Hispanic Black women have an increased risk of having a BRCA mutation and an increase in aggressive triple negative breast cancers. Um, and so we need to do better to find those earlier to help treat those better. And we also know our Hispanic Black and our Hispanic White women also have a higher 
chance of death from breast cancer ranging from 10 to 50% higher than our non-Hispanic white women. Um, you know, Black women are less likely to be diagnosed at a stage one breast cancer, and they're more likely to die from breast cancer. Um, there's disadvantages, you know, being diagnosed at a younger age and the tumor biology, which we can't eliminate the fact that these cancers tend to happen in these women at younger age, and that maybe they get in more aggressive tumor biology. But what we can do is provide earlier assessment, high quality screening. You know, we will need to reduce these disparities and we need to identify what it is that is the barrier to these barriers? Is it just, is it transportation? Is it available clinics in the area? Is it patient education regarding screening and breast cancer? Is it insurance coverage? Is it all of that? And how do we address those things and how do we fix them? So we need to devise a better plan to reduce these barriers for these patients, especially now that we know that what the, what some of these barriers are and start working at bringing those barriers down and seeing where the numbers go and then finding other barriers to make sure that those women get the appropriate treatment and care. Next slide, please. This was put out by um, the American College of Radiology, and this is based on some literature and research that was done in the last few years. And we now recommend all women get a screening risk assessment at the age of 30. So you need to talk to providers and especially our minority women, providers should be running through risk factors with them in family history and seeing if they need to see someone in the high risk provider to, to look at genetics and look at getting additional screening. All women should start mammograms at the age of 40 and get them annually. And there's a big talk about when you stop your mammogram and the number 75 keeps coming up. Um, and we at the American College of Radiology, American College of Breast Surgeons, the Society of Breast Imaging, don't recommend an end time for your mammograms. We do say that, you know, if there are com severe comorbidities that are going to limit life expectancy, there's no reason to be screening. If you have a woman who has a different cancer or some other disease that probably will take her life in the next five to seven years, screening mammogram probably is not necessary. I mean, if she does have something palpable found in the breast or there is a symptom, definitely be sending her in for a diagnostic mammogram. But a screening at that point is probably not necessary. But we have many, many women living well beyond the age of 75 that if there's a breast cancer found, could be treated and have no problem and still live well into their 90s and 100s. So we don't want to stop screening just because of an, a numerical number. Next slide, please. The other population I want to talk about when it comes to disparities is our LBGTQ community, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer. This population of people makes up about 4.5% of the population in the U.S. Um, and this population of this community does not tend to feel welcomed at facilities due to lack of education on who should be screened and why and guidelines that are out there or not. I think many systems um, practice with a discrimination that's an unconscious bias of heteronormativity, which means that we just assume everybody's heterosexual and that is not the case. And so because of that, we ostracize this part of our community, not even meaning to, but we do because we don't make, we don't take down barriers for this community to feel safe and protected to come into our facilities and talk to us. Many of these patients won't discuss their sexuality or you know, what they identify by with their physicians because there's a lack of education amongst the physicians and providers about, you know, what about asking about this stuff and about having discussions and about what the guidelines are for these people. Um, and so we need to break down those barriers and we need to have more open conversations and make patients feel welcome into our into our centers and hospitals um, so that they can get the treatments that they need. Next slide, please. Just this past November, the American College of Radiology put out um, specific guidelines, finally, um, for the LBGTQ community um, and for our transgender population um, specifically. And this has been a long time coming. I know, you know, when I was training 10 years ago, this was coming up, but there was no guidelines. Um, so right now, this is for patients who are of average risk. They do not have a high risk background. There's no genetic mutations. So this is just an average risk patient. Anyone who is a transgender female, the recommendation is annual screening mammogram at the age of 40, which has changed. It used to be 50, now it's 40. 
um, and that if they've used hormones for five years or greater. So five years is the mark for the hormone use. So once a patient's gotten to five years of hormone use and they're 40 or older, they should be getting annual screening mammograms if they're a transgender female. For our transgender male patients, they should receive annual screening mammograms after the age of 40, unless they've undergone a mastectomy. If they've undergone mastectomy, they still should be getting um, clinical screening of their chest wall because even when we do mastectomies, there is sometimes still some breast tissue that's left behind and we leave lymph nodes behind in the axilla unless it's a mastectomy due to cancer. But um, that way we're still, you know, screening them clinically to make sure if there's something that would show up, it will be felt with a mass, you know, if somebody's had a mastectomy, um, but they do not need a annual screening if they've had mastectomy, but if they've not undergone mastectomy yet, then they do need annual screening. Next slide, please. Now, this is a pretty extensive algorithm. And as you can see at the top, it still states 50 on the right-hand side under transgender women, that is now 40, but all the rest of this is pretty much standard. Um, and at the top, you have transgender women and transgender men, and it kind of goes through what I just talked about. And then you have cis women and cis men. So if any transgender female or male falls into the high risk guidelines, um, they would follow the cis women and cis men guidelines based on, um, based on those guidelines because all, all high risk patients, we wanna treat a little more aggressively. Next slide. And these are my references. Um, I welcome any questions at this time because unfortunately I'll have to be going after this um, to go take care of patients, but it was lovely meeting you all and talking with you today. And hopefully I gave you some good information. Dr. Kerger, thank you so much for that information. We, we certainly do appreciate it. We do have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, so let me start with the first one here. And this is regarding breast cancer in black women. To reduce these disparities, do we think that mammograms are enough, especially seeing screening rates similar between races? Yes, yeah, so no, screening alone is not enough to reduce the disparities of what we're dealing with in the in medicine period, but in breast cancer particularly, uh, which is why you know there's a lot of talk and, and research going on around what other barriers are women having besides just screening. We know getting diagnostics and getting biopsies is being delayed also, um, and we're working on trying to figure out what is that delay from, um, and more education to the population from their providers, from us, um, about who should be screened, how often, why, um, the risks of breast cancer in these populations. So I think, you know, we do need to do so much more and there's a lot of work still to be done in this, but I feel very good in the fact that we are finally moving forward with it. And there's a lot of literature coming out with it and a lot of talk all the time about it amongst hospital committees and how we change processes. Um, so I am hopeful that in the future, we will break down these barriers and it may be one by one, but we're gonna get there. Terrific, terrific, Dr. Kurt. Thank you so much. Um, let me ask our producers if we have any other questions that have come in. Yes, Deb, we do. Um, Dr. Kerger, does it change treatment options if there are multiple cancers with no determination of which is primary? Um, multiple cancers in the breast or multiple cancers throughout the body? I'm sorry. I, I would assume it's throughout the body. Okay. So um, would trade and change treatment options? Yes. Um, we would want to get biopsies of the things that, you know, we thought might be the primary. Certain cancers act certain ways. And so we tend to, when we look at the whole, um, be able to figure out maybe where we start with what could possibly be the primary. So let, and the other option is, is we're going to biopsy maybe the thing that's easiest to get to at that, you know, first, we don't, we don't want to go after something in the middle of next to your heart. If we have something that's in your breast and that's easier to biopsy and start there and see if that is our culprit. And then we can move on and biopsy other things. So we, we try to take the risks along with um, how, you know, how riskful is a procedure to a patient and where, what is the information we need to gather? I hope that helps. Terrific, thank you so much. We have one more question for you and then I know you need to leave. So we appreciate your time. Here's the question, any traction in screening blood women at younger ages? So as I said, we are, we are trying to get more 
providers out in the community, your family med docs, your internal med docs, your nurse practitioners to talk to their patients at the age of 30 about their risk factors and then get them in to see high risk um, providers um, to see if they have increased risk. And even if there's a slight increased risk, we're sometimes starting that screening earlier based on what we find in that clinical history. Um, if it's not over 20%, but close to 20%, we might start screening at the age of 35 for some of these women, depending on what the situation is. Unfortunately, there's not a one size fit all for all of this. We have kind of little blumps of areas that we know, okay, so you know, in our, in our black women, they have an increased risk for earlier cancers and more aggressive cancers. So we wanna pay attention to that group, but not every black woman's going to fall into that category. So we need to look at each individual patient significantly and look at her history and her risk factors and then make a plan based on that. Um, you know, can't, medicine in general is getting more personalized and especially in the breast cancer world, it's very personalized, but we know certain groups of people that are high risk and we wanna see them earlier um, and evaluate them earlier. Terrific. Dr. Kerger, thank you so much for spending time with us this morning and for sharing all of these insights. We so appreciate it. And we know you have a busy day, so we'll let you go, but thank you so much. Thank you all. And you have a wonderful day. We will. We appreciate it. So up next, we have another guest, and that is Chesley Cheatham. Chesley is the Manager of Oncology Outreach and Patient Education, Oncology Nurse Navigators, Oncology Secretaries at University Hospital Seidman Cancer Center in Cleveland. She'll be sharing details of the breast cancer screening project that she and her team are working on with the American Cancer Society. We're so glad to have you with us, Chesley. Welcome. Hello, and just a quick sound check. Can we hear? You're good. Excellent. Thank you so much for the, the invite. And it's lovely to be a part of this conversation. And, and Dr. Kerger brought up so many interesting and, and crucial aspects around breast screening, which I'll talk about a bit. But I, I am so appreciative that she pointed out some of the barriers around um, marginalized populations and, and how that can affect uh, women getting screening. So thank you for the, um, the thoughtful thoughtful presentation and, and thanks to the hosts here, Deb and, and Barb previously. Um, my name's Chesley and I, I manage the Office of Community Outreach here on the lovely shores of Lake Erie in Cleveland, Ohio at University Hospital's Seidman Cancer Center. So I'm just gonna talk briefly about our capacity building um, project on behalf of the American Cancer Society and sort of how our approach to sort of closing some of those gaps in screening with uh, populations here in Northeast Ohio, Cuyahoga County particularly. So uh, next slide. So just a little background, and I think that this is important. Um, I don't know that Cleveland is unlike very many or other large populaces with having unfortunate disparate gaps in poverty around um, our, our catchment area. So this was a map done by a local university, Cleveland State, and it just highlights the darker blue are where our higher level of poverty is. So I don't have a cursor, but, or I, I, you can't see it, but just sort of centrally to there, there's a few hospital systems, ours being one of them, University Hospitals, and one mile away is the Cleveland Clinic. But unfortunately, if you drew a circle around our healthcare systems, a mile in any direction, we find that our catchment area and populations are, are subject to large levels of poverty, large levels of uninsured patients and, and families and large levels of underinsured um, patients. And we know that that is um, a precursor or a barrier to getting access and screening in, a, in a, a regular manner. And not just through the lens of oncology with mammography, but all types of screening from blood pressure to primary care, et cetera, et cetera. And another sort of take on this slide is that it hasn't changed. Uh, this was done in July of 2017, but if we fast forward to 2021, it looks the same. Or if we look back 10 years before that, it has not same. It has not changed. Unfortunately, I believe that poverty is a carcinogen. And, and I got that, that, um, that those words from a, a physician that works here. And I, I had never heard it put like that before, but indeed it is. If you do not have uh, money or resources to access these very life-saving, crucial diagnostic imaging, then you are put at a, at a, at a huge disadvantage for healthier outcomes. Next slide. 
So just a bit on our hospital systems capacity building cohort, excuse me, cohort. So we're the second cohort and we are located in, in Cleveland, Ohio in the Midwest, but uh, we, our sister organizations are our colleagues from Michigan, Oklahoma, Utah, New Jersey, North Carolina, and Pennsylvania, all looking at ways to address system issues, collaborating with our communities to address ways to increase screenings. So for us, we are looking at disparities along the continuum, specifically around screening. Although our cancer program addresses issues from diagnosis, treatment, and all the way through end of life or, or survivorship. Next slide. So what does this mean? What does this mean? Dr. Kerger brought up a huge, um, gap that was created, unfortunately, in 2020 during COVID, which was the cease of mammography in our institution for about eight weeks. We completely brought mammography to a halt, a halt, pardon me. And like she mentioned, as we opened up, we found that there's a bit of a bottleneck. So we're kind of digging our way out for women to come back and get screened. Um, I think in our system, we canceled around 30,000 appointments. Let me repeat that number, around 30,000 appointments. That's kind of the footprint that our system has. And to do that, we think, oh my word, how, do, how are we gonna start doing that? For some women, they're like, you know, I'll do this next year or the year after that and so on and so forth. I think the ramifications that we will see years and years to come will be significant for, for women and, and for everyone who sort of delayed their screenings, whether it's mammography, colonoscopies, pap smears, so on and so forth. So the, the health systems project that we're working on now came just you know, as, we, as COVID was you know, unfortunately among all of us. And we were wondering what would this look like? And I'll talk a little bit about because we leverage our mobile mammography unit with a local federally qualified health center. But how do we do this amidst COVID? So we had to roll up our sleeves and say, what, what is it gonna to take to make sure that women are even comfortable coming in? Would they be comfortable coming on a mammal van, so on and so forth? But to bring it back to, excuse me, to COVID screenings during the pandemic, there was an, an alarming amount of fear. You can keep it on that one, no, that's fine. Alarming amount of fear around coming into the hospital um, it, you know, our, our hospital looked different. It was empty. We did, we still don't allow children here. People are masked. And if you're already hesitant in engaging in mammography or in any preventative care, this is one more thing that may dissuade you from coming in. So we, we have put messages on our on hold, our on hold telephone lines, uh, messages on our internet, not so much during social media saying, hey, it's time to come back. But we also ran into another problem. Once we sort of opened up our appointment lines back to start getting scheduled, we found that we created a bit of a bottleneck. So some women were really proactive and said, yep, I was scheduled in February, I'd like to come in. We found some patient dissatisfiers because you may be on hold for upwards of 30 minutes or an hour just to get scheduled. One of our online scheduling systems was a bit malfunctional and, and that's if you can understand how to use the internet to make your appointments and so on and so forth. So we really had to recreate and come back around it. To, again, how are we going to be able to get these women back to screenings? And those are people who are a bit tech savvy. So we, we know that in our catchment area, not all women have access to um, high speed internet, texting capabilities, so on and so forth. So uh, making calls on the weekends, making calls after hours, sending um, snail mail to women to say, you're eligible, it's time to come back, so on and so forth. Okay, next slide. So just a little bit to talk about um, what has happened during COVID, what has happened in the decrease of COVID screenings, cancer screenings during COVID. Um, so like we've mentioned, so that screening rate has dropped 60 to 80%. I think all of our healthcare systems had to stop or come to a complete halt for a period of time. Um, there has been a 65% decrease in incidence of new cancer diagnosis in April, 2020. Now, if all things were equal and everybody was getting screened, that would be really good, but it's not. It's because people are not being screened and we don't find, we haven't found the cancers like we did last year. And so that we know that that's gonna be challenging in years to come. So this is gonna potentially increase the number of patients with later stage cancers, leading to higher morbidity for these patients. And we know that that morbidity will be disproportionately burdened on um, 
populations of color, marginalized populations, our LGBTQ population, folks who are low SES, so on and so forth. So I think that if I opened it up, we could all share stories of how this has really impacted what is happening to our screening programs um, across the region and across the country. Next slide. So based on, excuse me, based on our systems capacity building, we wanted to make sure that we, this is sort of pre-COVID or during COVID, provided a strategy to access screening. So for our outreach department and our radiology department, we partnered using our mobile mammography unit. We wanted to target screening and education among our high risk populations. And for us, that is literally a clinic that is a quarter of a mile down the street. We can see their building from ours. And this is, um, we partner with a federally qualified health center um, called The Centers. It used to be called The Free Clinic. And we have provided um, a process um, by which women that they identify can get screened. And also we bring our mobile mammography there to do it. So anyway, the goal of that is to, to decrease late stage diagnosis outcomes in breast cancer with evidence-based screening recommendations in this population. And so our objectives of this year is to provide education to 200 participants. That's even during COVID, right? So 10 at a time, um, on the phone, Zooms, so on and so forth, and to host in those screening events at least four. And so we have completed one, we have three more to go, but we're really excited. Our first event yielded in 20 screenings. This was during March of this year and um, one at a time on the, on the unit, um, social distancing and our local federally qualified health center. We would allow women to wait in the waiting room, provide snacks, talk to them about what was going to happen, engage them in other healthy behaviors and qu answer questions about you know, ways to reduce risks of other cancers, give them education and also a way to follow up. So we've been very excited that that has been an opportunity to address that. Next question, next slide, pardon me. So how, do, so how do we measure this? Now, of course, we have metrics that we're going to provide to um, the ACS and this grant and our other cohort colleagues, but essentially the percent of women in this target area over the age of 40 that report having a mammogram in the past year. So this requires us to be um, you know, proactive with our colleagues at the centers and, and, and ask some data pools and, and exchange some information um, about what their, what their metrics are. So we've collaborated with the, the centers or that FQHC. And we know that this is gonna increase trust within this community. You know, I, I think that a lot of large health systems, you know, they may be the new and shiny building in the neighborhood and people who are uninsured maybe don't go to that building. They go to a community clinic that may or may not have 3D imaging. Maybe they have a 2D image or it takes a really long time to get the, the, the imaging that they need. I, I think that, Unfortunately, if you are disenfranchised or don't have insurance, that creates a level of distrust. And so we don't want that to be the case. So our idea is to take our technology, our 3D imaging, our big unit to them. And so, so we are removing that barrier of access, providing it in a day and a time that is um, amenable to the people that go there, providing transportation if that's an issue, and holding it in a space that is familiar to the people that um, you know, that access that clinic. And then another component, which we know that is crucial is establishing a compute, excuse me, a community navigation component. So, you know, with any screening service that I've ever been a part of around 15, 15 of the images that we have will need more diagnostic follow-up. And for the programs that we've worked on before, we know that that's a time where we can lose women to follow-up. The idea of like Dr. Kerger mentioned, the idea that you would have to come back for more imaging or potential biopsying can be just an anxiety-filled and debilitating experience. So as a part of this initiative, we have, we employ a community navigator. So this is the person that you're going to talk to over the phone when you make the appointment. This is the person that you're going to see when you get your mammogram. This is the person that you're going to see after your mammogram. She's going to call you and say, this is what's happening. And if you need additional imaging, you would have to come to our hospital, which is just down the street, but I will actually be there for you and with you. 
And, and as it were, on Monday, one of our community navigators met a woman from an event previously that we had. And that connection, that follow-up, that extra step, that patient-centered care made all the difference. Just having a familiar face and you know what? Did you find your parking? Here you go. This is where you have to be. It really, really makes a difference. And we do that in a way that's culturally concordant. We, we know that um, it's important to make people feel welcome. It's important to make people feel valued and, and provide care in a high quality, but also with dignity, right? So there's no indicator that you're a part of a program that provides free services or so on and so forth, because sometimes that's a little uh, margin that can make people feel marginalized as well. Next slide. So that's, that's basically it. I, I wanted to be able to leave a lot of time to ask questions of the group or open it up and, and, and get some feedback on what has worked for you or how we've been engaged. This is an image of our mobile unit. It's fancy and it's got all the, the bells and whistles. It's the Cadillac of, of mobile units, I'm told. In the middle there are community um, navigators and the FQHC navigators. So, and then the, the, bottom, the bottom picture is staff from uh, the free clinic. And as it were, our first site, we had um, visitors from the Department of Ohio Department of Health who had heard about it and wanted to learn a little bit more. So um, a welcome surprise and a, and a welcome kind of spotlight on some of the things that we're doing. And then in the far left, um, one of the patients and the, the screeners there. So we provided just a token of appreciation, a follow-up, you know, healthy snack and, and masks, of course. We all, we all had to be masks. But it truly has been a partnership of, of, I think, equity, which I think that anytime we are working with our community partners, maybe historically it hasn't been. So um, if, we, if I had to think about some lessons learned, I didn't input this into the presentation, but I would say that one of the mistakes that I have made previously is having a timeline that works for us, works for the health, healthcare system. And while that's great and dandy, we have to understand that our community partners may have different priorities, COVID being one of them. So in my head, I'm like, oh, we will have um, an event every month on the first, and this is how it's going to go and zoom, zoom, zoom. And they are very open to saying, hey, that's great, but that's not how it works. And I think that we have to listen to that. I think that we have to say, this works for us. We can do this together. The mammal van's not going anywhere. We have this. Um, and what is the process? So I'm happy to report that we do have a process now. It's, it's not just calling someone up. We get people all of the paperwork done before they even step on the bus so that it's not something that, you know, people are, you know, filled with anxiety. Our navigators help to write um, the information out for patients so that they don't feel like they have to have a certain amount of literacy or numeracy to be able to do that. And we offer walk-on, so which is, which is really nice. Um, I see a question in the, the chat that says, do they have a, do you have to have a, a referral? And ideally you do, and we get those referrals from the primary care physicians at the clinic, but we will take walk-ons if the women are, are able to get there. Also one of the unique kind of components of the program is that we screen women um, and men and women under 40. So um, we're one of the only programs that will do this free of charge. Sometimes women who do not have insurance under the age of 40, it's a little bit more challenging to get some of those um, free services. So we think that that's important. So we do hold some of our, bud our funding to accommodate that, as well as men who present with, um, with the need for imaging. We keep that as well. Um, kind of quick and dirty, but I, I am happy to continue to chat about that. I love this work and I'm so appreciative for the American Cancer Society and my, my, my local liaison, Angela Kalush, for helping us with some of the quality issues and, and reporting and, and just look forward to being able to provide this service for um, a long time to come. And I'm happy That's to work. A phenomenal presentation and we do have some questions that have come in through the Q&A and okay. so I'm going to give you just a moment to catch your breath but we are so grateful for your presentation it's been exciting to hear how things are going. Uh, first question how can payers partner with you on the mobile mammography screening opportunities? Yes uh, is, uh, so how can they do that so um, 
if when you say payers, I'm assuming that's a, an HMO or are we talking about like a, a private company and, and we can, you can just tell me what that is, but it's a simple phone call. We will work it out on the back end. If there's an opportunity that an HMO says, you know what, I have a, a list of clients or a list of, of patients who would be eligible, then we are happy to do the paperwork, get the MOUs and, and show up. So if you are in Northeast Ohio and that is something that you want um, to discuss, I'm happy to do that. And you can put my contact information in the chat to do that. Right, Same thing with private companies as well, yeah. Sounds good, Chesley, thank you. Um, you also have someone that would like to connect with you from the best breast and cervical cancer screening project. So we'll get that information to you. Yes. We have another question and that is, are you screening men on the mobile unit? We are not screening men on the mobile unit. Actually, we um, get them to come to our brick and mortar building. So if there's a question, just because of, um, we don't allow men and women to, to use the same area. So um, same program, it's at no cost, but we do get them routed to our mammography suite here at the Cancer Center. Okay, great. Uh, another question, how is the physician end working for those ladies that are in their 30s? Did you say physician working? Yes. How is the physician end working for those ladies that are in their 30s? Ah, so it, his, it, the, the women that we've seen in their 30s have been self-referrals, actually. Um, they often don't have a primary care physician. They call and say, I have a lump. What do I do? And so we say, thank you for calling. Um, our next appointment is, and ask them how, if they need help getting there. Gotcha. Gotcha. One more question that we've seen come in, and that is, what do you see as the impact of the Delta variant on the work now? Wow. Um, so I'll give it the perspective. I, I work in a hospital and we are seeing, unfortunately, um, larger numbers of our inpatient units being used to treat people. Um, the majority of those uh, admissions are due to the Delta variant. Um, from a community perspective, uh, we've had to cancel a few events. There's just been a lot of fear. Um, and, and I think, it, personally speaking, we are encouraging our participants to be vaccinated, but know that that's, that's somewhat of a hot issue and some of our populations are less inclined to get the vaccination. Um, we have not had questions, believe it or not. The, the questions that we do have about COVID, not necessarily with Delta virus, is do we sanitize in between patients? And, and we say, yes, yes we do. And you'll be the only patient on, on the unit when you come. Um, but, but yeah, so that's, that's pretty much it. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Chesley. We certainly appreciate that. Let me connect with our producers real quick and ask, are there additional questions that have come in? Yes, Chesley. Um, how, one of the questions is, how did you reach your unconnected population? Those people that don't have uh, internet, do not have mobile phones, how are you reaching them? That's a fantastic question. We do it with the help of the community partner, the FQHC. They have existing relationships with those patients and, and often are a little better um, able to communicate with them. So, so if, of course, we reach out multiple times, sometimes up to 12 calls, you know, letters, et cetera, et cetera. And we keep in contact with the navigator at the Fairly Qualified Health Center and say, you know what, it's been a while, we haven't heard. And it's actually only happened in, in one case. So I'm, I'm happy to say that that's, that's it. Um, but we do say, and the, the the navigator there said, you know what, let me try. Maybe it's an unrecognized number, um, but it's only happened one time so far, knock on wood. We have a couple more questions that have come in in the Q&A. Sure. Um, let me read you these. If a patient walks in without a primary care physician order, do you send the re who do you send a report to? And if there's follow-up needs? Yeah, so we take on that order. We have a, a breast surgeon here that, you know, we have an understanding that he'll write the order and the results, so, and take on the results. And so we're very happy that he does that. So if, in fact, a patient doesn't have a PCP, we say, you know, Dr. S, can you please take a look at this? He will do it. And then he will um, speak with us again about the results and getting that person connected to come back in. And that's really important because if you don't have a primary care provider, I think that. Um, you know, a lot of women are like, you know, I, I don't want to have to deal with that. But we tell them like, this, this is not your primary care. However, for this service, for breast imaging, we will be your provider. Um, can we get you connected for, to primary care? Would you like to learn more about that? We try that. But if they are ready and willing to get breast imaging, we want to make sure that they can get it. Perfect. The next question I'm seeing really dovetails with that, Chesley. Are there efforts to connect with women that are not connected with an FQHC? 
Yes, yes. So if women call and we are at the FQHC, there is information there, how to become a patient. Do you need anything emergent? Are you there for COVID testing, as, you know, HIV, all of the things. So we do, we do provide that information. Terrific, terrific. We have about a minute left. Let me check in with our producers if we have any other questions in the queue. The only other question I have real quick is, how do you, we know that transportation is a barrier to get to treatment, but how are you addressing your, the barrier of transportation to screenings? Yeah, so um, for this program, the mobile unit goes to the clinic and we do have the ability to offer um, bus passes. So we connect with the FQHC to say, is there anybody that might need um, transportation? And, and we handle it that way at that unit. At our, at our cancer center, uh, we do have programs to get people um, in using bus passes. During COVID, we, we utilize Lyft and Uber. Um, we have funding um, from a private donor and, and opportunities of other funding to make sure people do that. I, I don't know if um, people really understand the impact that if you do not have transportation, it might you might as well have an appointment on Jupiter. Um, short story, I'm, I'm not from Cleveland and when I moved here, I used to take our rapid, which is like a train from where I live. I live in a Western suburb to work. I used to do it one day a week just to see if I could get to work on time and see if I could do that. And I did it during the winter and I about had to go to therapy, how hard it is just to do these things. And I, and I thought if you are, if you have children or if you have to, you know, get an appointment or heaven forbid you get bad news, that just doing that, just sitting on public transportation, doing this da, 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 in the cold, in the snow, could be just really overwhelming. And, and that is something that, that I'm very cognizant of and I, and I make sure that we have that for our patients. Chesley, thank you so much. Your presentation you. this morning was fantastic and we're so grateful to be partnered up with you. So thank you for your time. Thank you for sharing. And we're very grateful for your presentation this morning. Thank you very much. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Well, let's move on then to our next presenter. This morning, we have a brief update from Leo Almeida. Leo Almeida is with the American Cancer Society Can Cancer Action Network. He's the government relations director in Ohio, and he has some great updates to share with us regarding our government relations team. Welcome, Leo. Thanks, Deb. Uh, for 20 years, the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network, ACS CAN, has made cancer a top priority for policymakers at every level of government and had measurable impact in reducing cancer's toll on individuals and families nationwide. ACS CAN empowers volunteers across the country to make their voices heard to influence evidence-based public policy change that saves lives. We believe everyone should have a fair and just opportunity to prevent, find, treat, and survive cancer. As we mark our 20th anniversary, we're more determined than ever to stand together with our volunteers and save more lives from cancer. ACS CAN continues to be a strong advocate for breast and cervical cancer funding in Congress and in state legislatures across the country. As the, federal, as the federal level, we advocate for funding for the National Breast and Cervical C Cancer Early Detection Program. This is an important program that has provided over 15.2 million screening exams to more than 5.8 million people since 1991. During the current debate over the federal budget, we have been urging Congress to provide $275 million in fiscal year 2022 for this program. You can go, yep. Yeah. Um, switching gears to our state advo advocacy efforts, I'd like to share some highlights uh, from Ohio and West Virginia. In Ohio, the state legislature passes a biennial budget every two years, which is when we activate our volunteers to advocate for funding for the Ohio Breast and Cervical Cancer Project, also known as BESA. The budget bill was passed in June, and we were able to secure $1 million per year over the biennial. BSEP is a critical safety net program that provides free mammograms, cervical exams, and other prevention services to more than 7,000 low-income Ohioans each year. The decrease in screenings during the COVID-19 pandemic will likely cause demand for the program to grow in the coming years. As you heard from our earlier speakers, mammogram rates declined by 60 to 80% because of the pandemic, causing a backlog of preventative screenings. 
The pandemic has taken an economic toll on Ohioans, causing some to lose insurance or income. For these reasons, screening services offered through BSEP will be a critical resource for thousands of Ohioans. Similarly, in West Virginia, our staff and volunteers have advocated for funding for a similar program known as the West Virginia Breast and Cervical Cancer Screening Program. This program works with over 300 providers statewide to ensure eligible women receive the services they need. We're happy to report that West Virginia lawmakers passed an annual budget that included $400,000 allocation to this program. This amount has been included in the state budget in previous years, and ACS CAN will continue to educate lawmakers on the need to, to continue funding in the future. Thank you for allowing me to join you today to share some of the great work we're doing at ACS CAN. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. We're glad to have you, and we really appreciate that update. So we're going to pause for one second here and do another poll. We would love to have you share with us what sector you represent. So you'll see that popping up on your screen. And if you would just make your selection and let us know which sector you represent. We would appreciate that. And while you're making your selections, let me introduce our next speaker. Our next speaker is Carlo Wysocki. And Carlo Wysocki is the Senior Director for Health System Interventions. And in this role, she leads the effort to align health system intervention strategies with the American Cancer Society program of work, which includes return to screening efforts, HPV vaccinations, grant funded community projects, breast health equity, and access to care. During her 20 year career with ACS, Carla has served in a variety of roles at the national, regional, and state level. Prior to joining the National American Cancer Society team in 2019, her responsibilities included overseeing the 13 state North region patient navigator program, partnering with NCI cancer institutions and collaborating with state comprehensive cancer control programs, representing the society on local and state tobacco control initiatives. She holds a master's degree from the University of Iowa and she resides with her husband and her two sons in Rochester, Minnesota. Thanks so much for joining us today, Carla. We turn the program over to you. Great, thank you, Deb. Um, thank you so much for the invitation to, to join you today. And I didn't know if you wanted to pause, Deb, at the poll question, if there was any follow-up you had with that. I saw the briefly pop up on the screen there. Right, no, we're good to go, Carla, thank you. Perfect, perfect. Well, thank you for the invitation to join you today. Um, I'm happy to be here to, to share some resources that we have, but also to talk with you a little bit about the American Cancer Society's efforts around screening or return to screening, um, which you've heard Dr. Kerger and uh, Chesley talk a little bit about. Um, what you've heard already today, I, I think this all flows nicely with it, um, that truly the pandemic has impacted cancer screening across the nation. Um, we've seen a, a huge decrease in the number of screenings, and I think we, we've seen that for a variety of reasons. Um, over the past year during the pandemic, um, health systems have paused screenings. Um, there has been um, fear and an avoidance of wanting to go into health systems by many patients, um, of wanting to go back in to get screened. Um, we've seen reduced capacity in our healthcare systems, and I think Chesley talked a little bit about this. Um, if, if you're um, adding uh, additional measures to sanitize um, areas or have fewer people in a waiting room, that capacity decreases and not as many individuals can get screened. And also just staff disruptions. Um, how many of you or people that you know um, were uh, kind of realign uh, to other areas um, during the pandemic that maybe you were doing COVID testing or um, uh, contact tracing. And so we're seeing that and we know that uh, that decrease in um, cancer screenings has also greatly contributed to what you've heard about earlier today, that drop in cancer diagnoses. And that's not a good thing. Um, because we know that as individuals will likely be diagnosed um, in the years to come, there's a greater likelihood those diagnoses will come in at a, a later stage cancer, um, which can be much more difficult than if, if caught early as we all know. 
So coupled with the millions of individuals who lost employer-funded, employer-sponsored health insurance uh, during the pandemic, the American Cancer Society knew that there's some things that we need to do. We need to address this, um, this screening backlog, address these health system issues, address the, um, the issues that we're seeing that um, impact um, public policy. And we know we can't do it together. There's no way one organization can address all of those things. And so um, what we, we did was come up with these building blocks uh, for return to screening um, last fall. And I'm gonna briefly talk about those, but again, would just note that um, these are things that we're doing uh, in conjunction with partners like Chesley and others uh, that are on the call today and things that we're doing to work with patients, with providers, with health systems uh, to increase screening rates for, for cancer. So next slide, please. I'm just gonna quickly go through these, these um, examples for each of these um, building blocks. So the first one is our, our national consortium. We've convened uh, leaders from across all sectors, um, government, advocacy groups, uh, health systems to come together and talk about uh, what we can do at the national level around increasing cancer screening and um, um, activities, what's the action we can take. We're hosting issue hubs. I believe our second issue hub is coming up here in early September. That's open to anybody, but where we have uh, experts on the call that are able to talk about emerging issues related to, to screening. And so that is definitely an opportunity to learn more and interact and hear from other um, individuals. Next slide, please. Our second um, building block of the six is our public awareness campaign. And hopefully you've seen some of these images that are on the slide here, either in print media or on um, um, advertisements or in social media. But really our goal is to raise uh, awareness of the importance of getting screened for cancer. Um, one of the things uh, is not just focusing on uh, increasing cancer screening due to the pandemic, but also looking at the disparities that already exist with cancer screening and how those have just been magnified during the pandemic. There's so many more disparities uh, that, that do exist. And so what we're doing is looking at how we can have this um, public awareness campaign to encourage anybody who's never been screened or not up to date on their screenings to get screened for cancer. Next slide, please. Our next building block is research. Um, we already know that the impact this pandemic uh, is having um, on cancer screenings and ultimately cancer diagnosis will be huge. But we have our ACS researchers that are looking at the impact of the pandemic across the whole cancer care continuum. So what is this impact gonna be on treatment? What is this impact gonna be on survivorship? And how do these disparities that exist uh, factor into all of this. So um, we do have uh, ACS researchers and we're partnering with other researchers uh, to, to start to study this impact. Next slide. We have um, our state and coalition work. So there's already so many things happening across all states. There's um, cancer coalitions, there's networks um, of individuals, of health systems that are coming together. There's round tables. So how can we uh, leverage all of these existing networks and existing coalitions to uh, address local needs related to screening? We know that the needs in Ohio might be different than the needs here in Minnesota where I'm at. And so uh, the resources needed might be different. So the American Cancer Society is partnering with these existing networks and existing coalitions to start to talk about what are some of those needs uh, that, that are targeted or specific to states or areas. Next slide, please. Our fifth of six building blocks is policy. And again, this is just uh, 
showing that our support through the American Cancer Society and American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network is critical, that we're there to support cancer screening, cancer care at uh, not only state level, but also the federal level. And these are some examples of the different public policy efforts that are being, being done um, right now. And hopefully many of you have heard of or, or you're engaged with these as well. Next slide, please. The final building block, this is uh, where I sit. This is the interventions work and the team that I lead uh, through our, our global headquarters, or our national um, team. So we've got a team that is uh, working on health system interventions. How can we work with uh, health systems to increase screenings? So we have a partnership in place that started this spring that we're partnering with 48 health systems from community clinics and FQHCs to hospital systems, partnering to increase a screening for breast, cervical, and colorectal cancers. We're doing this to, um, again, start to look at the data, start to look at what are the evidence-based interventions that we can work with health systems to implement to start to increase those um, those screenings in, in the area, especially where we've had this backlog and screenings that were paused a year ago. All of the participants in this initiative uh, are, um, are participating in a learning collaborative. So they're able to share their challenges, share their best practices with each other and learn from other health systems. Uh, the next slide has just a little bit more information about this. Um, so all of these systems that are participating uh, started in, in May, in, in the spring, and they will conclude their interventions in December. Um, they are implementing quality improvement um, tools, quality improvement measures, and as I said, participating in a learning collaborative. There are five learning collaboratives across the United States. One of them is in your neck of the woods. So I wanted to share this with you. Um, this is a, a learning collaborative that has um, participants in Ohio, Indiana, Kentucky. And so you can see here, um, that the, the sites participating are focused on breast or colorectal cancer screening for their projects. Uh, next slide. So as we're um, looking at ways to partner, and you saw those examples the American Cancer Society has in place with our building blocks, we have developed a number of resources and tools that are available as we're partnering and what we're able to offer up to um, health systems, not only participating in the um, intervention project that I mentioned, but available to anybody. And so you'll have these slides uh, after the, the call today, and you'll be able Able to access the links that you see here on each of these slides. But the first one I wanted to mention was our uh, messaging guidebook. We did some message testing uh, in December of last year um, during the pandemic. And we, um, through this public message testing, we wanted to find out what messages related to screening really resonate with individuals, what, um, what's impactful. And what we heard was that messages mentioning pandemic or mentioning COVID-19 did not resonate. Um, individuals, did, that was not driving them to go in and get screened. And so this message book really pulls together what those messages are that do resonate and what we would recommend um, as you're working in your health systems and encouraging individuals to come in and get screened. And the three messages that you see on here are three that um, that scored the highest or resonated the most, I guess, but really focusing on one in three Americans will get cancer, um, but finding it early means it might be easier to be treated. And then you can read the rest of them on here, but just a very similar, um, but again, kind of um, not mentioning COVID, not mentioning, mentioning the pandemic. We also have these, uh, these one pagers, these take a deeper dive into cancer screening and talks about different um, strategies to increase cancer or increase cancer screening uh, that um, 
that you might find helpful. So this link will take you to a toolkit where you'll find one pagers um, focused on specific recommendations for the cancer types that you see here at the bottom um, of the screen, as well as increasing HPV um, vaccination. So again, I encourage you to take a look at this. This is great information. Again, really simple to understand and, and use as you're um, thinking about screening or, or thinking about the messages and what you might want to do to promote breast cancer screening uh, in your, your clinics and hospitals. This was a, another toolkit. Um, this is specific to colorectal cancer, but I included it because I think there's a lot of great um, resources and suggestions and guidance in here that um, even if you're you're really focused just on breast, um, would encourage you to take a, a peek at this toolkit as well for some good information. And finally, the last thing I want to mention is the American Cancer Society's landing page on cancer.org. This just launched this summer. Um, and this is just kind of a screenshot of what you'll get when you go to cancer.org slash get dash screened, which you see here on, on the screen. But this has some great tools and resources for the public as well as, as providers as you're um, looking at uh, any messaging, any um, initiatives around screening. Um, next slide shows you um, a screenshot of one of the resources that's available. And uh, this one, I know where we've encouraged um, systems to uh, download or to share this with patients, but um, this is a, a great one page or easy to understand reference guide that um, shares the screening recommendations by age, but also provides some questions that you can ask your doctor um, related to screening and getting screened. And, and similar to what Dr. Kerber and, and Chesley mentioned, we know that there's questions out there about, um, do I get screened before or after a, a COVID vaccine? So we want to encourage that dialogue uh, between patients and providers. And again, would recommend this as a, a resource. So that's what I have today. I hope that those um, resources and tools are helpful and that overview is um, helpful. And again, I just encourage you to uh, take a peek at those, those links and um, feel free to access those uh, that you would find helpful. Thank you, Deb. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing all of those tremendous resources and sharing a little bit about the work that you're doing. I hope that you all can see that we've put some live links in the chat for you. And we also have the slides that will be shared after that'll have those links that Carla mentioned. So Carla, thank you. You're welcome. So the next thing we have for you, we wanted to, we wanted to wrap up with some ways that not only you can be involved, but we wanted to share with you a little bit about the work that the American Cancer Society is doing in the breast cancer space. So um, we wanted to share one of our favorite videos with you. Take a look. There's a woman in a hole. She can't get out. It's a live or die situation, but she's in that hole. And a man walks by, he's a millionaire. He writes a check to her and says, oh yeah, he drops it down in the hole. And she keeps the check, she needs the money. But she's still in that hole. And then a minister walks by and he, she's screaming, I'm in a hole, can somebody help me? And he blesses her. She appreciates the prayers. But then the American Cancer Society comes by and all of a sudden that person jumps down in the hole. And she says, I just told you, I was stuck in this hole. Why would you jump in here with me? And that person says, cause I've been in this hole before and I know the way out. They know the way out. We wanted to share that with you so that you'd be aware of all the partnerships that we have. And we are thrilled to have each of you on today's call so that we can begin partnerships with you. Let me share a little bit more about the work that we're doing. The work we do at the American Cancer Society is supported by the amazing work of our donors and our volunteers and our friends like you, many of whom are on the call right now, and we wanna say a big thank you. We appreciate each and every one of you. 
If you're interested in helping to support the breast cancer work of the American Cancer Society, we wanted to take just a minute and share with you a few of the opportunities that we do have coming up. You know, the pink space is a big space for all of us and breast cancer awareness and work that we do to end this disease is important. So let me share with you a few things. Power of Pink, you can see a web link down there. It's a virtual fundraiser that we do across the states of Ohio and West Virginia. We also have several Real Men campaigns. Real Men, in, this is where we engage men in the fight against breast cancer. We also have some, uh, Making Strides Against Breast Cancer Walks that'll be held yet this fall across the state. You can see the cities listed there where we will have some of our campaigns as well as some of our walks. And again, the web link for the Power of Pink. To get more information about any of these activities or other ways to support the mission of the American Cancer Society, we ask that you just indicate your interest on the post-event survey and someone from our team will be more than happy to follow up with you. We wanted to thank you for taking time to be a part of our forum today, to share in the dialogue, to share in the discussion. This conversation continues and we anticipate having more and more of these kinds of educational and informational conversations as we move on. The next one we want to share with you is we will be doing a lung cancer forum, the impact of COVID on lung cancer screening and tobacco cessation. We want to hold that one on November the 4th. We're giving you a few months notice. Please share that information with anyone that you work with, your colleagues, your friends, et cetera. We would love to have them with us. We also ask that you take a moment to fill out the post-event evaluation. We would love to know how we're doing. So we want to say thank you. We appreciate your attendance today. We hope that this is something that's been important to you as it's been important to us. And we're grateful to each one of you. We hope you have a wonderful day.